I have already made you co-host. So if you would uh, go ahead and share the thought. I think you need today. to stop sharing. If yes. Mike is telling me, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. And uh, well, I thought for the day, oh, hold on, I got, what just happened? If, I don't know. Oh. Is that on your computer? It's not on mine. Okay, on my computer. Let me if go you back. click on that green dot up top, it will give you a full screen image. Okay. Now it says I'm screen sharing. Does it say philosophers up there? Yes. 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 It does. Okay. Well, good. Uh, well, thought, thought for today is about philosophers. And, um, and uh, let me see. This is really crazy. I can't see it. So do you see Tao, Buddha, Confucius? Yes. Gandhi? Yes. yes. Okay, well, those are some, but being a mother and a grandmother, my favorite, one of my favorite philosophers is Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and he would have been a, a really, he's a good Rotarian too. And one of, he, he has many, many sayings. And one of them is, is a friend is one of the best things you can have and one of the best things you can be. And you can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for others to come to you. You have to go to them sometimes. So that's what Rotarians do. Oh. We certainly go to other people. And he teaches us to be in the present moment too. Life is a journey to be experienced, not a problem to be solved. So mm. live, living in the moment. And this is one of my favorites. We all like to make better friendships. And when he said, how lucky am I to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard? Oh. And today is actually uh, National Prayer Day. Um, I didn't know you, you know that. And Winnie has a, has a prayer. God, take me on a walk today with my feet or heart, not with my own purpose. In fact, not with a purpose at all, except for walking and seeing, hearing, smelling what there is to see and hear and smell and maybe touch tree bark or get stuck in a log. Then, like Rue and Piglet, go visiting or bringing birthday presents. Open my heart to Eeyore and Tigger's hearts. Keep me huff -a lump brave, red balloon laughing, aware that I am not the wisest one, and always walking to find, willing to find someone who needs finding in another corner of the hundred acre wood. Amen. So there's my philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I Thanks, will stop Marcia. here now if I can figure that <laughs> out. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. And now I will pull this back up briefly. Whoops. Sorry. And now we have several people we would like to welcome. First, a fellow Rotarian, Ed Tyler, uh, is a friend of Peter Moore. Ed is the president of the Rotarians on Amateur Radio and is joining us from Alabama. Welcome. We're very happy to have you with us, Ed. Thank and, you. And yes, and I hope you'll I hope you think about joining us again. And by the way, for the benefit of our members, Ed is now in the last two months of a three year term as president of his club. I am in awe of you. <laughs> and uh, next we'd like to introduce some, uh, an, a, a particularly special guest, brand new member, Sunda Kroonquist, who I look forward to being able to introduce to more of you in person. She's an absolutely delightful, an upbeat human being. And I think that she will bring a lot of uh, positive energy to our club. So welcome, Sunda. I'm so glad you could be here today. And we also have special guests. David Stover is with us uh, for the second time, David, right? Yes. And Benjamin Fisher. I think, Benjamin, is this your third meeting? Am I correct? Yes, I becoming a regular. <laughs> oh well we Wonderful. welcome it's it's great to have you with us thank you 
I'd also like to welcome our speaker who we will introduce more formally in a few minutes, Dr. John Mulcahy. I personally am really looking forward to your talk. And Erica Clark, thank you for being with us today and helping to make this possible. And by the way, I should have mentioned this gentleman during the Rotary section, James Tran is a member of the UCLA Rotaracts board. And James, we're really pleased to have you with us once again. So welcome. And I'm, I'm, I apologize if I have left anybody out. Is there anybody I should have mentioned and didn't? Okay. <laughs> I try to keep careful track. So a few announcements. Uh, May is a spectacular month for our club. Look at all these marvelous Rotarians who were born in May and three very special ladies born on the same day. So I think we'll show this slide again next week. Uh, but uh, belated happy birthday to Richard Thompson and Carol Rosenstein and belated happy birth or no upcoming birthday to James Tran, who shared with me his birthday is this coming Saturday. So James, happy birthday to you. I'm sorry I didn't know to put your birthday on the slide. <laughs> and May wedding anniversaries, Margo and Tom Barron next week and the following week, Lynn and Mark Rogo. So congratulations Hi there. Welcome to, to That's all, gonna of, be 50, all of you. That'll be 55 years for Margo and I. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. Years old. I'm in awe. That's wonderful, Tom. And I think for Mark, Mark couldn't be here today, um, but I think for Mark and Lynn, it's 45 years. So uh, that's, that's truly impressive. And speaking of May anniversaries, Tom Barron also has a Rotary anniversary this month. Oh. Is, that, is that correct, Tom, 14 years? I have no idea. So May's a big month. <laughs> I, I, at least according to the profile. <laughs> okay. So again, congratulations. And, and we're really, really pleased to have you. I'll just touch on this very briefly. Our uh, district conference comes up next weekend, meaning the week after this coming weekend. <laughs> and I will touch on it again as a reminder next week. This just gives you an idea of the conference schedule. If you haven't signed up already, I encourage you to do so. It's only now $75. So definitely well worth it. And I think it will be fun. John O'Keefe is, is uh, serving as our scribe for today. John, thank you. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. Great. And one of my favorite, favorite times of the month, this is actually for April. But we had so much going on last week, I, I made the decision to push this back. It's really a privilege to have the opportunity each month to recognize a member who contributes to the vitality of our club and has been a long and loyal member. And this month, I would like to recognize past president, Ali Shoji. Ali, as many of you know, has a great deal going on and she's among other things, working full-time family. She's in a very demanding master's degree program simultaneously. Ali volunteered at the beginning of this Rotary year to take on social media responsibilities for us. And, and regardless of her schedule has been doing it faithfully every single week multiple times a week ali i hope that you know how much we love and appreciate you and <laughs> so you will be receiving this certificate in the mail i wish i could present it to you in person <laughs> but you will be receiving it and 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 a pin in the mail and that's why i wanted to make sure that you would be here today uh, so I, I know that your schedule is tough and, and, it's, and it's not easy for you to make it to every meeting. And I notice all of 
the Facebook and Instagram postings that you do. And I know a lot of other members do too, and they're greatly appreciated. We've just, we've not had that before. And so thank you again for all that you do for our club. And thank now- you. Love you so much. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I really appreciate you saying that. Well, right back at you, <laughs> for sure. And, uh, and now I would like to turn things over to Tom, who will introduce our speaker. And Dr. Mulcahy, I'm going to make you a co-host so you have no problem in uh, showing your screen. OK. All right, we ready. <laughs> Oh, today is going to be a special day, everyone. I think we're in for a special treat. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John Mulcahy, Director of the Observatories of the Carnegie Institution for Science. Since its founding in 1904, Dr. Mulcahy was not there present at that time. Uh, Carnegie Observ Observatories has been a leader in research on the evolution of the universe and is a the prime reason why Southern California is the world capital of astronomy today. Dr. Mulcahy joined the Carnegie scientific staff in 1999 and became director in 2015. In his, this role, he oversees the observatories campus in Pasadena, as well as his large telescopes facility in Chile. He is also science deputy of the observatory's parent organization, the Carnegie Institution for Science, where he oversees research directions in all of the organization's five departments. Dr. McKay's own science focuses on key areas such as dark matter and black holes. His discoveries have received prominent coverage in the New York Times and Time Magazine, among others. He is also a frequent consultant to NASA and the National Science Foundation. Dr. McKay also leads many outreach and educational activities throughout the region and beyond. He created the annual Carnegie Observatory's Astronomy Lecture Series held each spring at Huntington Library. He hosts astronomy nights of schools and other organizations, as well as programs for gifted high school and undergraduate science students. Last year, he received the Helos Award from the International Rotary Humanitarian Star Awards Program, honoring his achievements in scientific education. Today, we're in for a real treat. You're up, doctor. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have an echo, somebody. Let's see. Let's see, can you still hear me? Sounds okay mm -hmm. now. Okay, good. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me today. I appreciate all, all your efforts in, in getting me here. So today we have kind of a, hopefully a fun topic. Let me start by sharing my slides because astronomy is much better with pretty pictures. And so um, as, uh, as, as um, Tom mentioned in the introduction, um, Southern California um, really is the center of astronomy and astrophysics in the world. And I'm, I'm not sure it's something people appreciate. So this this particular talk I'm gonna to give today, will tell you a little bit about that. Um, and in fact, the, the takeaway message, if you remember one thing is that Southern California really is the, the center of astronomy research in the world. And so I'm gonna start by talking about how we got there with a little bit of history. And then I'll talk about some of the current exciting stuff going on in, at Carnegie and other institutions here in Southern California, which you'll be familiar with. And then talk a little bit about the future at the very end. And so how did Southern California end up on the map as the center of astronomy? This um, really goes back to the turn of the last century, uh, about 1902, 1903, uh, and these two gentlemen here. On the left there is Andrew Carnegie, a name, of course, many of you will be familiar with. Carnegie, of course, was one of the wealthiest uh, men in the world at that time. Um, and uh, at around that time, the early 1900s, uh, Carnegie decided to give away, as you probably know, most of his fortune uh, for philanthropic uh, good. And um, one of the, individuals who took advantage of that was the gentleman there to the right, George Ellery Hale. Hale was a solar astronomer at the time, 
working at the University of Chicago. And Hale had built the biggest telescope in the world in Wisconsin. And he quickly realized that Wisconsin was not a great place for astronomy, probably for pretty obvious reasons. The weather in Wisconsin is pretty awful. And Hale was convinced that Southern California with our beautiful climate was the place to do astronomy. And so when he read that Carnegie was giving away the money, he reached out to Carnegie, set up a meeting and convinced Carnegie to fund an observatories here in Southern California. And thus the Carnegie Observatories was founded. And Hale, as uh, the director of the observatories, built the three biggest telescopes in the world right here in Southern California. Um, the first of these was the Mount Wilson 60 inch followed by the Mount Wilson 100 inch. Uh, these two telescopes, as their name suggests, are up at Mount Wilson and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, you can see them here from Pasadena and large parts of Los Angeles. And then eventually he helped uh, build the Palomar 200 inch and Palomar is down near Temecula for those of you who may, may be less familiar with it. But these three telescopes located here in Southern California really revolutionized our understanding of the universe. And it's really fair to say that our modern understanding of the universe really can, can date back to the work done on these telescopes in the first half of the last century. In particular, um, at Carnegie, we had a, an extremely famous astronomer, um, I think without a doubt, the most important astronomer of the last hundred and something years, um, named Edwin Hubble. And of course, you'll be familiar with Hubble's name because the Hubble Space Telescope, which you hear about all the time in the news, is named after Hubble for all of his amazing accomplishments. Um, I'm actually sitting in Hubble's old office as I give my talk here at Carnegie, so that's kind of fun. Um, and Hubble, uh, why is Hubble famous? Well, um, Hubble really had the two most important discoveries in astronomy in the last 400 years, done right here, well, in this office, actually, and right here in Southern California. The first of these was uh, in the 1920s, uh, astronomers really had no understanding of what the universe was like. Uh, most people thought the universe consisted of a single collection of stars called the Milky Way that we would be part of. But what Edwin Hubble showed in 1923, 1924 was that in fact, there were these other smudgy things on the sky. And on the right there, you see a picture of one of these. This is his original data. And these other little smudges are other collections of stars similar in size and nature to the Milky Way. They're just much, much further away. So what Hubble did is he took the universe from being kind of a single small collection of stars to the really immense thing that we now understand today. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I like to say that Edwin Hubble discovered the universe basically in 1923, 24. And this is revolutionary. And in, in my mind, it's very similar to what happened 400 years earlier when Copernicus and Galileo combined really put the sun at the center of our solar system. You remember that was a, a, you know, humans had always assumed the earth was the center of everything. Uh, Copernicus suggested the sun was the center of the solar system. Galileo took the observations that really proved that. Of course, got in a lot of trouble for doing that 400 years ago for Galileo. Really, Edwin Hubble's result is of the same magnitude, but done right here in Southern California because he, he completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe. As if that wasn't enough, five years later on, he went on to show that the universe is not a static thing, but is in fact expanding. And this is of course a huge and revolutionary idea. It's a very difficult idea for our minds. But if you think about something expanding and you trace it back in, so in time, it means at one point it may have had a beginning. And so the idea that the universe had a beginning, which of course is central to the Big Bang Theory, uh, really came from Edwin Hubble's results. And so these two results in the 1920s here really kind of launched Southern California on the map. It put us on the map in terms of astronomy and astrophysics. This is a picture from our, our library here um, at Carnegie taken in 1931. You'll of course recognize Albert Einstein. On this particular day in February, 1931, Albert Einstein was giving a lecture on, on his ideas of the universe. And the reason he was uh, interested in being here at Carnegie was because he was very interested in understanding what Hubble's results meant for his theories. And so in fact, Edwin, uh, Einstein ended up spending a good amount of time here at the observatories to try to understand that better. Um, this is just another picture from that same lecture. I like to show this picture because this is one of the most iconic pictures of Einstein you'll see everywhere. And it was taken right here at the Carnegie Observatories uh, in Pasadena. Now, Hale, going back to our director, Hale was right that Southern California is a great place for astronomy because of our beautiful climate. What he had not anticipated was the growth of Los Angeles. And so these are three pictures taken from Mount Wilson in 1910, 1925, and 2002. And you'll see the lights in the valley caused by all of us um, and this is what we call light pollution in astronomy. And unfortunately, when you go out at night in Los Angeles, anywhere in Los Angeles, really, and you go up and you see maybe 50 stars in the sky, you should see about 3,000 at any one moment, and you see about 50. The reason you don't see the vast majority is because of this light pollution. This light pollution effectively floods out at 
all the faint stars. And so just as that means you can't really do great star observing from your own house here in Los Angeles, it also means the astronomers cannot do observing at Mount Wilson anymore, at least in a significant way. And so for this reason, Carnegie astronomers recognizing this starting in the 50s and then eventually in the 60s, moved our telescope operations to Chile. And so um, I'll tell you, talk a little bit about Chile. This is, these are some amazing um, uh, pictures. On the, on the left, there is a picture on the way up to our mountain. And on the right, there is a picture actually on our mountain. I like to point out um, these images because you'll, you'll notice what they don't have, which is a lot of plants. You don't see trees, you don't see a lot of plant life. This is because Chile is really the driest place on earth. I don't know if people are aware of that, but we, our observatory is located very close to the very driest place on earth where it rains less than an inch a year. But I like to remind people here in Southern California, it rains about 15 inches a year normally. And we consider that a dry desert. Um, this one, once again, less than one inch a year. This is the real desert on earth. It makes it a great place to do astronomy. I do like to point out that despite the lack of, of um, of rain, we have a huge amount of, of animal life on the mountain, which I always find amazing. Here's just three of our favorite examples. Um, a, a llama is a domesticated uh, uh, guanaco, so these are the wild versions of llamas. A viscacha is this unique South American animal that's a, a, a basically a, um, a rabbit meets a squirrel kind of thing. They're about this big, they're pretty significant. And then on the right there, we see the tarantula. So despite the fact that this is one of the driest places on earth, there's a lot of life on the mountain. Now, because this is so remote, we are hundreds of miles from the nearest town. We have, a, on our observatory, we have a whole, basically, little town. We have to have engineers, we have to have paramedics, chefs, everything you need for people to live in this remote location. And so, as astronomers, we go to Chile, uh, normally, prior to the pandemic, <laughs> we would be flying to Chile, spending about a week on the mountain, collecting data with our telescopes, bringing that data back here to Pasadena, and then working on it. Uh, because of the pandemic, we forced, we've been forced to go into remote mode. And so unfortunately, we now can operate our telescopes remotely. But we still require a little town of people on the mountain. Chile is very, very far away. And people often say, well, is it really worth going that far or having an observatory so far away? And then you see what the night sky looks like in Chile. And the answer is clearly yes. This is an image of what the night sky would look like with your naked eye, basically. This is a, not a long exposure here um, from Chile. And this arc that you see here is the Milky Way, like you have never seen in Southern California, or even, it turns out, in the darkest places in North America. Um, the reason for that is the sky is more spectacular in the Southern Hemisphere than the Northern Hemisphere, because the center of our Milky Way galaxy is actually in the Southern sky. And so on the right-hand side of this image, you see these beautiful, bright regions of the Milky Way. And those regions are really very difficult or almost impossible to see uh, from the Northern Hemisphere. So I always tell people, if you're really into looking at stars, you must make one trip in your lifetime to the Southern Hemisphere and a very dark site. It can be Chile, which is, of course, great, but you could also do Australia or various parts of Africa. Oh, and the other reason the Southern Hemisphere is interesting is because the Milky Way has two little companion galaxies that are visible, once again, with the naked eye. And these are them. You see these little blue spatches on the sky here. These are called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. These are our, our companions in space that we can only really see from the Southern Hemisphere. So for all these reasons, Chile is really an amazing place to do astronomy. I just like to give us an idea of the scale of telescopes today. Uh, our telescopes, our biggest telescopes in Chile have mirrors that are 21 feet across. On the right there, you see the white is the back of the mirror and you see a bunch of people hanging out. So this shows you the scale of these relative to people. Telescopes are very big. These telescopes are three times the size of the telescopes that Edwin Hubble used here at Mount Wilson. Um, I don't wanna go into this in detail, but um, uh, Hubble uh, had these two amazing results I talked about, but there's many other people who've contributed here at Carnegie. This is just kind of a laundry list of some of the most interesting and high, high end results here. Um, it's really kind of a laundry list of astronomy over the last hundred years. Um, and um, I'll just point out a couple key people here. One of them is Vera Rubin, a very famous, for one of the very famous early women astronomers. And Vera was the first to show that galaxies like the Milky Way are dominated by this mysterious force we call dark matter. We still don't know what it is, but we can tell what it, we can know it's there because of the way things move in the galaxy. Gravity is much stronger than it should be. So there has to be something there we don't know. Um, more recently, our previous uh, uh, director, Wendy Friedman was the first to measure the precise age and size of the universe. We actually know the age of the universe quite accurately. It's about 13.7 billion years old. I find that a remarkable accomplishment that humans can actually date the universe. Um, and more recently, Mark Phillips is part of the team that showed that not only is the universe expanding as Edwin Hubble found, but it's accelerating. That is, 
the expansion is increasing in time to due to a mysteri mysterious force we call dark energy. So this is just some of the results, but basically Carnegie alone would put Southern California on the map in terms of astronomy. But we're not alone here. We have many other organizations and they all kind of have some relation to each other. So from Carnegie sprung Caltech. Turns out our director, George Ellery Hale, was one of the founders of Caltech. And one of the reasons he wanted Caltech was he wanted the MIT of the West, as he referred to it. And so Caltech, um, of course, is an amazing uh, technical and science school. They produced 38 Nobel Prizes uh, over through the years um, and many, many accomplishments in astronomy. The one I, I always like to point out here is many of you will remember about, about 15 years ago now, Pluto got demoted. We all grew up with Pluto being one of the nine planets. Uh, but Mike Brown at Caltech um, made the discovery of many other small planets, just like Pluto in the edge of the solar system, which our option was to either add a bunch of planets or demote Pluto. So we decided to demote Pluto. But that was work done at Caltech. Um, and of course, out of Caltech sprung the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which you all be familiar with. And J JPL is really the center of all exploration of the solar system, that is our local system, um, that NASA does. So every time you see a Mars rover, or pictures of any of the planets. These are some planets in our solar system, all taken with missions out of JPL. And JPL really is the center of that research in the world. And more close to you, we of course have, is UCLA. And so I'd like to highlight the work of, of my friend and colleague, Andrea Getz. Many of you may be familiar with her. Uh, if you can get her to give a talk to you, you should. Um, she's much in demand because she just won the Nobel Prize last year. And she won the Nobel Prize for this amazing work here. Uh, by the way, she was a Caltech graduate student. So she has a connection once again in Southern California for a while. What you're seeing here, if you've never seen this movie before, is a spectacular long-term work she's done. She's used the telescopes they have at UCLA, which they use, uh, these are in Hawaii, to monitor the very center of our Milky Way galaxy. And that's located by the star here. What you're seeing is you're seeing motions of individual stars over about a 20 year period. And what you'll notice is as the stars come near the center of the image there, they tend to speed up very rapidly. And this tells you that the gravity is much, much stronger at the very center than it is anywhere else. And what this tells us, but there's nothing there. And so you could do a calculation and show that there's actually a giant black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. This is in fact, some of the best evidence we have for black holes, which is why Andrea um, won the Nobel prize uh, last year. And she's one of many uh, great astronomers in UCLA. So the combination of Carnegie, Caltech, JPL and UCLA really make, without a doubt, Southern California the center of astronomy research in the world. I should point out, in case there's any USC fans, there may not be many in Westwood, but um, USC is the one place, in, a university in Southern California that really does not have a very strong astronomy program. They've just never invested in it for various reasons. Um, but the rest of us have, and, and we're happy to be here. Okay, sorry, what am I doing? Okay, so now speaking of getting here, let me just talk quickly about some of the things we're trying to do today. One of our big questions is we know the universe started with a big bang. How did it go from this big bang to producing beautiful structures like the one you see here? This is an image of a galaxy. This is what the Milky Way would look like if you could step outside of it. What you're seeing here is the light of hundreds of billions of stars and trillions of planets. And the sun and the earth is just one. The sun is one of those hundreds of billions of stars and the earth is one of those trillions of planets all held together by gravity. How did the universe go from this explosive event to forming these beautiful structures. Well, thankfully in astronomy, we have a time machine because we can look at objects that are far away. And by the time we see them, we're seeing what they look like in the past. The way to think about this, I always say is the sun is about eight light minutes away. That means it takes light from the sun, eight minutes to reach us here on earth. If the sun died this instant, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes because it would be eight minutes before the, the, the death of the sun actually reached us. And so, we can do the same thing, but even further out. This is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of an extremely tiny region on the sky. If you take your fingers, pinch them in projection, it's always hard to do this on Zoom. Oh, I can do it this time. Imagine the smallest uh, area on the sky. This image is that tiny little area. We integrated away for weeks at a time with the Hubble Space Telescope. What you're seeing in this image, every single speck, the tiniest little thing you see is a galaxy like this or a galaxy of some form. So they're so tiny because they're so far away. In this image, there these galaxies are typically about 10 billion light years away. That means the light in this image left those galaxies 10 billion years ago, which means we're seeing what the universe looked like 10 billion years ago. 
Billion's a big number. Unfortunately, many of us don't get to use the word billion very often in our lives. But in this particular case, let me remind you, the Earth is about 5 billion years old. That means this image you're seeing is how the universe looked 5 billion years before the Earth even existed. So as astronomers, we can look at these very distant galaxies. We can look at these much closer ones. This one's very nearby. That's why it's so big. And we can see how have they changed over time by looking at objects at different distances. Turns out it's very complicated, <laughs> but astronomers are making great progress on this. And, and we think we have a good idea of how the universe went from this big bang to producing the structure we see today. As I said, it ends up being complicated like weather, but, it, but it's interesting. Um, a second thing you often hear, you know, we are made of stardust. What does that mean? The universe is continually recycling its material. That's one reason why it's so complicated. On the left, you see there an image of a star. A star is a little nuclear fusion, uh, factory, basically. It's converting one element to the other in the process releasing energy. And, and in fact, producing new elements. The universe started with hydrogen and helium, and now we have all these great elements that we're made of. When these stars die, they blow up in these explosions. This material is scattered into space. Gravity will eventually bring some of it back together and form a new star. And that's what you see there on the right. You see a new star forming cloud. And the whole process starts again. And so for over and over and over again, all the element, the universe is constantly recreating and creating new elements. And so this is a plot that demonstrates that. Uh, you don't have to look at it in detail. You'll remember from your high school chemistry, the periodic table, that's the elements of the universe. This is a periodic table where they've now been labeled by where the elements come from. You don't have to look at it in detail, but you can look at the human figure, which, which will give you an idea here. The orange elements are elements that are created in the middles of stars through this nuclear process. So what this means is 73% of you has come from that. that. That, by the way, is mostly your carbon, your oxygen, and your nitrogen. About 9.5% of you is hydrogen. And that hydrogen was created right at the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. So that means 9.5% of you is 13.7 billion years old. So you may have your own birthday, but think of your body as being around in much, much longer. But the fun thing is when, when you hear songs, we are made of stardust, it's true because about three quarters of you, that 73% comes from the centers of stars. Now, what's, what I want to point out here though, are these interesting purple elements lower in the chart here, because these are some of our favorite. AG is silver, AU is gold, PT is platinum. You probably all have some of those. Those elements are too hard to make in stars. Stars never get big enough to make. These elements are only made in these very rare collisions of the dense centers of old stars. And these stars, they, they basically will orbit each other and eventually they'll, they'll blow up in a very big explosion, in a crash. Um, and we had predicted these in the 1930s and it was only three or four years ago now, <laughs> August 17, 2017, we saw this for the first time. These are called neutron-neutron star mergers. These mergers produce huge amounts of gold and platinum and silver, but, but because these, these events are so rare, that material gets spread out around the universe. And that's why we don't have a lot of gold on earth because there just aren't very many of these rare events. Finally, the last question I wanna talk about is the biggest question of all, which is, are we alone in the universe? And this is being driven by the fact that we're finding thousands of stars around nearby planets. When we grew up, we all grew up with the nine planets in the solar system and then Pluto got demoted. We now know of about 4,300 planets in the universe, these around our nearest neighbors. And they're all sorts of really cool planets, very different than the ones in the solar system. We have planets covered in oceans. We call those water worlds. We have planets that are so close to the surface of their star that they're always lava. They don't have a solid surface. We call those roasters. Then there's this really interesting class of objects we call super Earths. And the reason these are interesting is because they appear to be the most common type of planet in the, in the universe. Um, this is just a histogram of the size of planets of those 4,300 planets that we now know of. And at the very top, you'll see the solar system. On the solar system, we have Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Earth, down in that order. Those are the rocky terrestrial planets that we, of course, live on one of those. And then you have the big planets, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. And those are big gassy planets. They don't have a solid surface. Interestingly enough, most of the planets in the universe appear to be in between the rocky planets and the gas planets. And we don't know what those are. So are they more like the Earth or are they more like the gas giants? And the reason this is interesting, because if you want to look for life in the universe, you want to look for a rocky planet where we think life could exist. And in fact, we're just starting to do some work on this. This is 
a recent re result by a couple of our postdocs, which showed that at least one super Earth takes, it's a very hard experiment to do, appears to be rocky. And so this is good because this means if, if many of these super Earths are rocky, there'll be lots of places to look for life in the universe. I have a whole separate talk on life in the universe that I will come back and give if people are interested. Finally, let me just wrap up here and talk about the next generation telescopes. In, Ch in Chile, we're building this giant telescope called the Giant Magellan Telescope. There's seven mirrors. These mirrors for, are used together to form a single mirror about 80 feet across. So to give you an idea of scale here, one of these mirrors is smaller, I mean, is bigger than our current biggest telescopes. And so now we have seven mirrors working together. This is a giant telescope. It's 24 stories high. This telescope in Chile will be used to really examine the next generation uh, of questions. This just shows some of the mirrors in process. Um, I do like to show the movie of how the mirrors are made because it's so interesting. We make these giant 25 foot mirrors by having these basically containers with thousands of pieces of, of glass that we heat to high temperatures and then melt to form one giant piece of glass. This is inside, I love this shot here. You can see the glass melting to form a single piece of glass. And then once we have the glass, we then put a little layer of aluminum or silver on it that turns it into the mirror. So anyhow, I want, let's see. And so this is just a little movie to show you that telescope again in motion. I like to show the movie to remind people, this is 24 stories high. It's like a 24 story high building, but it's a building that has to rotate and point. And so that is something, you know, this is a engineering marvel. We have a hundred engineers already working on this project. Um, and we hope that this telescope will come online by the end of the 2020s. So we're very looking forward to that very, very soon. And so with that, let me wrap up. Oh, let me go back. I went ahead one, two. Let me wrap up and say what I hope you've learned here uh, today is that first of all, Southern California is the center of astronomy research in the world. So we're not only the city of entertainment, we're the city of astronomy research. Um, and that's been true for well over a hundred years thanks to the telescopes built here in Southern California. And the universe was effectively discovered here. The fact that it was expanding, the fact that it's accelerating was all discovered here along with other exciting things I talked about. And with this next generation of telescopes, we'll remain on the forefront of astronomy research for decades to come. And let me just end by saying, um, uh, if, since we talked about social media earlier, we of course are on social media. And if you're interested in hearing more about astronomy, uh, please follow us on, the ver on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram or Carnegie Astro. We have all sorts of public lectures as well. Um, we do a series at the Huntington normally, which are, we're now doing remotely. Um, and if you'd like to be on our mailing list, we'd be happy to, to invite you to those. And so with that, I will end my show and um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Doctor, I have a dozen questions, I think. But <laughs> one thing I'd like to ask, if you don't mind. Sure. Is that, uh, I neglected during the introduction to, to title your speech, it was called Eyes on the Universe. Now I totally understand Eyes on the Universe, that's why. Excellent. But I have one question about the fact you talked about um, the Mars rover. Yes. I, it seems to me in looking for life on other planets, et cetera, like that, it seems to me, I understand that if the planet Earth was minuscule degree difference from distance from the sun, life couldn't exist. So why do we, and I saw a, uh, the Mars rover video, how we actually sent the rocket out and landed on the Mars, which is fascinating. But how, why do we go there? Why do we go to Mars for future research? When I think your eyes on the universe, all these telescopes are doing just as much good for um, deriving all the data we need to have. Oh, Tom, you're setting me up for my next talk. So I, I definitely have to come back and give my search for life in the universe. I, I actually, so I disagree with your first statement. It is probably true that if you move the earth a bit, life as we know it may not exist. So we might not be here on Zoom, but I'm actually, there's actually still a decent chance that one Mars had life. I think it's unlikely it has life now. So one of the point of these missions is to actually look for that, to look for evidence of previous life. There's some people who think Mars still could have life, but if it didn't have life, it got pretty close. But there are other places in the solar system that potentially have life. I'm one who believes that life is probably very common in the universe. Um, and so in fact, that, that's what my other talk is all about. So, however, that said, you are right that the telescopes, there are two different methods. One is to use the telescopes to look for life in other ways. And that, that's described in that talk. But the other is to actually go to places and look. And there are very few places we can go to. Mars happens to be the easiest place after the moon we could get to. So that's prim primarily why. I should also point out that 
the reason why the um, mega billionaires are trying to go to Mars, like Elon Musk, is because they, they see a, a future in terms of space travel. It could be at some point in the future, you go to Mars for a vacation. I personally wouldn't recommend it right now, but I, I think that that's what they're thinking. I think that the and, and things like minerals and mining, and there's all sorts of reasons they go. It's not primarily to look for life, although that's what the scientists would find most interesting. Thank you. Um, Any other uh, questions or comments? Sure. Uh, I, I had a question. Okay. So, Brian, uh, John, and then Ed. Okay, so you, you had mentioned the advantages of having telescopes in South America. Um, we hear about fantastic discoveries from the Hubble having mm. telescopes outside the United States. You know, the progression here, we're, we're going to the moon, we're, we're probably gonna go to Mars. Um, are there distinct advantages to maybe having uh, telescopes based there for discovery? Yeah, there's a lot of talk about, particularly the moon. Um, uh, the challenge is cost. And so um, I, this, I thought you were gonna ask a different question, which is why don't you just do everything in space? Um, you've gone the next step, which once you do it on, on space bodies. Um, I often point out because, for instance, the next generation space telescope, which is being launched later this year, is about a $10 billion project, um, where that telescope I just talked about, uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope, is more like a $1 billion project. And it's a much bigger telescope. It turns out anytime you go into space, it's going to cost you 100 times more or something. And the next step, which is to go to the moon, would be even more. And so um, there's also questions on the moon in terms of dust and various other things. Um, so I... I think it's unlikely we'll do that in our in my lifetime, but maybe at some point when the cost, when it's easier to go back and forth to space and do things that'll happen. So there are some advantages to it, but it's just so expensive. It's easier to be on the ground. Thank you. Doctor? John, yes. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, was the man most responsible for bringing out the uh, uh, starting the uh, the astronomy program in Southern California, uh, along with uh, uh, George Hale from the University of Chicago, how much money uh, is estimated that he put into that that project, uh, Andrew Carnegie? Yeah, so Andrew Carnegie's initial gifts for the Carnegie Institution for Science, which is our current organization, he gave about twenty two million dollars which in, in two gifts, one in 1902 and one in 1910. Now $22 million in 1910 was a lot of money, right? Oh my, but I should right. say that that funds not just astronomy, that funds, we have, we have biologists, we have departments all over the country. Um, the astronomy probably would have been, those telescopes were not that expensive at that time compared to today. They probably, but it probably would have been an investment of a couple million dollars at that time. Um, Today, as I talked about, the big telescope is easily over a billion dollars, maybe closer to $2 billion. That's the scale in, in, modern, in modern, of course, these are much bigger telescopes too. But, yeah. you know, $22 million is a lot of money. And uh, Carnegie, as, as people probably know, he was the, his, I just read this the other day, his equivalent, his wealth today would have been 340 million or something, a billion, sorry, or something like that. Um, because people are talking about uh, Bezos and, and, he had more money than Bezos has, you know. So, <laughs> oh yeah, and, he was uh, a very wealthy guy. Yeah. He was very, very wealthy, but he gave it all away. And I love to remind people of that. I That's think right. he gave literally almost all of it away. And uh, right. he did a lot, you know, 50, uh, 2000 libraries in the US were funded by Andrew Carnegie. He did a lot of great things in the end. Yeah. He wanted uh, he wanted Caltech to be the, was it the MIT of the West Coast? Was that it or what? Yeah, that was Hale. Yes, yes. That was, oh, that was Hale. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, the idea was a more technical school as opposed to, for instance, UCLA, which of course is a very broad, you know, UCLA is great in many things. Sure. They have great astronomy, but Caltech is very specialized in science and technology. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Ed, Ed, you had a question. Ed, you're on mute. Uh, the no, I do not have a question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> there was talk about uh, building a, a large telescope on one of the mountains in Hawaii, and then they ran uh, into uh, problems because it was a na native uh, <clears throat> mountain or something uh, for certain ceremonies. Yes. Uh, is that uh, 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 finished? Uh, are they uh, still contemplating building that telescope in Hawaii? 
Yeah, so that's um, that's the 30 meter telescope, which is slightly even bigger than the giant Magellan telescope. It's comparable to the size of the one I showed you that we're looking in Chile. That telescope is actually being largely led by U University of California, so UCLA and, and the others, and Caltech. So the, um, unfortunately, um, it has not been resolved. So the idea, they, they want to build it in Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is a sacred site for the native Hawaiians. It has not been sorted out yet. They've been on hold for about seven years. I actually don't know how that will end. It'll be quite interesting. There's a chance they will abandon Hawaii entirely and end up in Chile. We've had talks with them about that. Um, the nice thing about being in Hawaii and Chile with these two telescopes is you get access to the whole sky. There are different objects in the northern and southern skies. And so for us as an astronomer, having the whole sky coverage is very interesting. So I hope they go to Hawaii, but it's politically very difficult. And I, I'm glad that I'm not in charge of that telescope. <laughs> Because that's a very politically difficult situation to solve, unfortunately. Doctor, is it possible to explain in one minute what a black hole is? Sure. Um, well, I don't know, one minute. A black hole is just a region of space where the gravity is so strong that nothing, including light, can escape it. So Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that the fastest anything can travel is the speed of light. And so when you turn your light, you know, when you when you turn your light switch, that light coming out is traveling as fast as anything can travel. A black hole has such strong gravity that even light can't escape it. Let me back up one step. On Earth, you know, we send a rocket to space. It has to go fast to escape the Earth's gravity, right? But if you increase the Earth's gravity, eventually you would need to be traveling faster than the speed of light, and nothing can do that. So at that point, we're stuck. So um, basically, if you had a flashlight on a black hole, it, rather than go upward, it would just turn back down on itself. <laughs> Boy. That I have a lecture on that one too. <laughs> Everybody, kids love black holes. Black holes and aliens are, are every kid's favorite. Topic. <laughs> so I put my email in the chat if anybody would like to email me. If you want to sign up to our um, our online email list, just send me an email, please. I would appreciate it. And if there's no other questions, I'll let you y'all get on with your the rest. Of your, oh, I have one more. Sure. Yeah, where'd you go to school, uh, doctor? I went to UC Berkeley for my undergraduate, and then I went to the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins for my uh, PhD work. I see. Thank and you. then John, I came back to California. I'm a, nat I'm a native Northern Californian. I was born in Carmel. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> John, 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 let me ask you a question. Uh, does, is the uh, universe infinite, or are there uh, other uh, universes out there? So the answer is we don't, well, OK. When we say the universe, when I refer to the universe, I'm referring to our universe, which is, is, is all we know about. It's entirely possible that there are multiple universes where you can't communicate between them. This is a really big and outstanding question. It's very difficult to know, know if there's a way of testing that model. Um, and so, so we don't know. And when you say it's infinite, it's infinite in the sense that um, this is where it gets really, really tricky. And I tell people, don't think too much about this because it'll just your brain can't handle it. Everything in your existence occurs in space, right? So I have this pen and it's relative to everything around it, right? The universe is the space itself. And so people always say, well, what's on the other edge of it? And that's because you're thinking of things in space. Your brain can't, our brains, at least my brain, can't comprehend, you know, space itself. I, I don't know, I'm not doing a great job of explaining this, but it's, it's like, don't, sp don't spend too much time thinking about it because your brain can't do it. <laughs> Because we're, we're, we've adapted to living in space. Everything, everything has a space and a timeline for us. And so the other question people have asked before the Big Bang, what was there before? Well, there was really nothing there before. And that's also like, how is that possible? <laughs> and so when we get to that stage, I tell people, this is where religion can take over. Because, <laughs> you know, why was there a Big Bang? I have no good explanation for that. Any religious explanation is just as good as anything I can come with, up with. Well, <laughs> does the universe have an end? Well, no, it doesn't because it's everything. Well, does our universe have an end? No. Oh, well, no, it doesn't. That's we. It doesn't. That's the thing. It is itself. It's everything already. <laughs> That's where your brain can't. And that answer doesn't make sense because once again, you're thinking of things with set limits because they're in the space. Well, I know that's not me, a good answer, but there is no good answer. <laughs> excuse me. You you mentioned that the universe is expanding, but yeah. I understand the rate of expansion is slowing down. Doesn't no, it's accelerating. It's actually increasing. But the rate of growth is slowing. The rate of growth. No. no expansion. No. The rate of expansion is slowing down. No, no, no. It's accelerating, Tom. It's actually increasing. 
we thought it was slowing down. That was what we thought like 25 years ago, but it's actually accelerating due to this dark energy force. Yeah. Okay. And once again, no good explanation for that. It was a complete okay. surprise. And the people who found that won the Nobel Prize for discovering that because it was so unexpected. John? The, uh, did, the, uh, did you give this uh, uh, statistic before, but about when, what's the estimate of when the Big Bang occurred? About 13.7 bill, billion years ago. 13.7 billion, okay. Yeah. Did, can, can you explain the concept of antimatter? Um, not easily. Well, not easily. So we, we don't fully understand <laughs> it. <laughs> Are we, we, well, the, I should say antimatter, it, you know, as you probably know, antimatter and matter are, are kind of two opposites. It's almost like a plus and a minus that when they interact, they destroy each other. Um, we, what we don't know is that there's an imbalance in the universe. The universe didn't form the same amount of matter and antimatter, which is good because we are here. And so, um, Otherwise, we wouldn't. If it was the same amount, the universe basically would have annihilated itself. We think, and it wouldn't exist. That's as good as I can get on that quickly. <laughs> you guys have a lot of questions for a Rotary Club. I have to say, I'm giving a lot of Rotary talks. Um, I'm on a tour right now. I do about two a week. I, this is my second one. I did Burbank on Tuesday, um, and uh, it's so fun because every club has a very different set of uh, people and different questions and different fascinations. Uh, so I should end and say one thing we're hoping to do is we're going to do an all rotary Southern California rotary event here oh. at Carnegie. Um, oh. You can come and see Edwin Hubble's office and we have lots of lots of famous historic things here. Once we can open up and do that, we're going to do that because I'm giving so many talks. We just felt it's a good opportunity for people to come and see this. Is, it's a very historic place here and the universe was discovered right here. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Among yeah, people. John, where where is the car where's where's your office here it's in the oh, middle of no you never would know it, it's on the 210 off the 210 north north of lake it's in a, it's on a residential street we predate any of northern pasadena we were here in 1904 and so nothing was here and this location was considered close to mount wilson so people could get up to mount wilson pretty easily that was why we're here fascinating let me let us know when <laughs> we'll participate any way possible to publicize and uh, hold a, a rotary group meeting like that. That's terrific. Absolutely. Yeah, we're definitely going to do it because, because I, I'm giving something like 25 talks this semester to yeah. Rotary. So, um, <laughs> and you and, were the first, Tom, to request all four talks. And I think today's was a great way to oh, start the series. Wonderful. Today was the introduction. So yeah. I'm happy to come back and talk about the life in the universe, particularly, is very popular. We will take you up on that, Dr. Mulcahy. That's Absolutely. wonderful. Thank you. I would be happy to come back. And, it, you know, it's a shame we can't do it in person, but I do appreciate people. I, I know it's not easy on Zoom, so I appreciate when people are willing. To, they're so interactive on Zoom. That's always a good thing. Well, I have to say, you obviously have such a passion for your work that it, it's almost like being in, you know, seeing you in person. So thank you. I, uh, that's great. I love to hear that. You haven't seen me in person though, Nancy, so. <laughs> well, I I'm hope- I'm a little animated. I yeah. hope this isn't as close as, as I'll get, but I really truly want to thank you for being with us today, speaking for myself and I know for many other members, this was an absolutely fascinating talk. I would love to have you come back and give the other talk that you suggested. I really want to thank you for your time. Eric, I want to thank you for setting, for making arrangements. And as a small token of appreciation for your time today, we will be making a donation to the Westwood branch of the Los Angeles Public Library in your name. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And, thank you. And, and we will absolutely be inviting you back. <laughs> thank you so much for being here and kudos to our program chair also for making this happen. I also want to thank our guests for being with us today. And once again, to congratulate Ali for all that, that you do for us. We will meet again, same time, same place next week. And in the meantime, everybody have a safe, happy and healthy week. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. <laughs>